So we're going to, I'm going to keep going with what we're supposed to do in John chapter 20. John chapter 20. Everybody say John chapter 20. John chapter 20. Very good, because that's where we're starting. Mary Magdalene. Now I won't, I'm not going to reteach the lesson for, uh, that I did Sunday afternoon. And, um, we even had a visiting couple in here Sunday afternoon. They're probably watching now going, he, he's a little strange, isn't he, dear? So, oh well. Uh, John chapter 20, if you would please let me get in my notes here. I, I, something I, I didn't catch until uh, I was looking at this this afternoon. This is the, this is the Catholic Church in Turin, Italy. And they are the ones who are the keepers of the Shroud of Turin. And they don't have it out every Sunday. They don't put it out every Sunday. They take very good care of it. And, uh, and so anyway, I, I like how someone took with their cell phone a picture of part of the Shroud with the sign that says, No photograph, no flash, no cellular. It's always somebody going, oh, they mean all of those people over there, click. Like those signs in Florida. If you ever drive through Florida, Orange Country, you'll see signs all over those orange groves, right next to the high $1,000 fine for anyone picking oranges or, or grapefruit or whatever out of these orchards thousand dollar fine possible year imprisonment and we're on a vacation when i was about i don't know 11 12 years old something like that and uh that was back in the days when you could ride in the back of the pickup truck dad had a little camper shell back there he had it nice he had a bed back there in a little camper shell you know that's where me and melissa rode and mom kept going honey stop honey stop honey stop and he's going judy you're going to go to jail for this. If you go to jail, I'm taking the kids back to Missouri. I don't know what you're going to do. And oh, honey, stops. And finally, she talked him into stopping. And here she is running down into those orange groves, picking fresh. And I'm going, Mom, you going to go to jail. And I'm like, can't you buy those in a store? Good grief. My mom's probably going, you ought not tell that stuff, Mike. Trust me, that's the easy stuff I'm telling. I'm telling you the easy stuff, all right? Uh, let's see here. John chapter 20. Uh, we'll pick it up in verse 11. It's good to have everybody with you and with us tonight and all you folks online. Uh, again, let me remind you, um, we will be here Sunday morning, obviously. Uh, it's Christmas Eve. We'll be here Sunday morning for Sunday school and for morning service. Uh, the afternoon we will dismiss. And um, so then, of course, the next day would be Christmas Day. We will also be here with all three services on January 1st. No, no. De December 31st is the Sunday. And uh, we will have all three of our services there. And... Um, and let's see here. We, we thought about going till midnight on Sunday afternoon, and I'm, I'm not sure if I could talk that long. So I thought maybe starting at 4 o'clock, I could just stand John up here, and he could talk your ear off until midnight. Easily. Easily. That could, that could be done easily. Right, John? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So, uh, anyway, uh, and then uh, pray for us. Um, I'm going to go ahead and say this. Uh, I'm, we're going back to Kenya uh, in January. Uh, we're going to be gone several weeks. Uh, me and a couple other guys in our church. This first time we've taken uh, some people that uh, were not like in our family or uh, works here for the church. And um, I had I had a, I had. Some guys saying, uh, can I go? And I'm like, uh, really? You want to go? Yeah. So um, I, I'm just kind of rejoicing in that. But uh, just keep us in your prayers. 
and uh, we'll sort of give you uh, the dates as that time draws near. Uh, we've got a couple good preachers coming to fill the pulpit uh, while I'm gone, some guys you are familiar with and some guys you know and, and uh, guys that we trust are not going to try to destroy the church while I'm gone. Amen. That would be good. So anyway, uh, I'm looking forward to a good time out there ministering with our pastor friends in Samburu and Turkana. Uh, we're going to do a feeding again while we're out there. So just pray for uh, all of those things. Um, those people are hungry. They are. And they're not just for food. They're hungry for the Word of God. And I am, I am honored to be uh, in their presence. So just pray for... Uh, me as I prepare all the lessons and everything like that and um, we'll we'll keep in touch with everybody while we're out there all right John chapter 20 let's go to the Lord in prayer ask his blessings tonight Heavenly Father Lord it's good to be in your house tonight gathered together with all of our brothers and sisters in the Lord those who are gathered here those who've gathered with us online and Lord those who'll be listening around the world Father we thank you for that and the ability to do that. Lord, what a time we live in. Uh, Lord, when we can share the gospel and share the message that you've given us literally around the world with ease. And Father, we know, Lord, that those days, uh, they may not be around forever. And so, Father, while they are, we ask your blessings on it. And we ask, Father, that you give us the grace and the strength to make the most use of it that we can to be a blessing to as many people as we can, not just physically with feeding the poor, but, Father, the spiritually with feeding their souls and, and bringing in converts to Jesus Christ and, and uh, showing the lost that they need to be saved. And, Father, there's lost people in Kenya just like there's lost people here. And so I pray, dear God, that you would just bless and minister to us and minister, Lord, to through us around the world tonight as we study your word. Lord, I love, I love your word. I love, Father, what we've got uh, gathered here tonight. So, Lord, just bless it. And we ask this in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen. John chapter 20, verse 11 is where we're going to pick it up. We, uh, I titled last, uh, titled Sunday afternoon, uh, Mary Magdalene, the first witness. And she literally was the first one to see him alive, standing there. Uh, you remember she thought he was what? The gardener, okay? Uh, and uh, boy, did she get a surprise there, okay? So anyway, verse 11, we're going to pick it up from there and then move on. But Mary stood without at the sepulchral weeping. And as she wept, she stooped down and looked into the sepulcher and seeth two angels in white sitting, the one at the head and the other at the feet where the body of Jesus had lain. And they say unto her, Woman, why weepest thou? She saith unto them, Because they have taken away my Lord, and I know not where they have laid him. And when she had thus said, she turned herself back and saw Jesus standing. Now let me just throw this in here. Why? Why were there two angels in there? Yes, David. Is that representation of the ark? Representation of the... Oh, I gotcha. He went. Some of you know what that is. Um, that's pretty good. I hadn't thought about that. I like it better than what I had. Alicia, what did you say? Two witnesses? That's what I was going to say, but that's pretty good. The two... The, yeah. Here's the throne of God. Here's the two angels covering the throne of God. And uh, I guarantee you those angels knew who Jesus was. He's the chief angel of every angel. They knew exactly who he was. I, I, like, I like that answer. Man, I'm going to have to... Yeah. I, I used to get, if I'd hear some preacher preach something that was just fantastic, I used to get mad and say, God, why didn't you give that to me? And God always said, I just did. <laughs> you were listening, right? And so, okay, I'm glad, he, I'm glad God gave me that through you. Uh, but anyway, yeah, that's a good one. I like that. 
Uh, but two angels standing there, one at the, and it matches, one at the head and one at the foot. Uh, they're on both sides. And, and you know, um, verse 14, when she had thus said, she turned herself back and saw Jesus standing and knew not it was Jesus. Jesus saith unto her, Woman, why weepest thou? Whom seekest thou? She, supposing him to be the gardener, saith unto him, Sir, if thou have borne him hence, tell me where thou hast laid him, and I will take him away. Uh, so, let's see here. That's verse 15. I want to read. I don't have this in my notes. Uh, verse 16. Jesus saith unto her, Mary. She turned herself and saith unto him, Rabboni, which is to say, Master. Verse 17. Jesus saith unto her, Touch me not. For I am not yet ascended to my father, but go to my brethren and say unto them, I ascend unto my father and your father and to my God and to your God. So in verse 18, Mary Magdalene came and told the disciples that she had seen the Lord and that he had spoken these things unto her. Now on verse 19, which is what I have on the screen. Then the same day at evening being the first day of the week. Again, I mentioned that um, we, uh, Sunday night, the, being the first day of the week, uh, new life, new beginnings, a new start, uh, Christ's resurrection. This is um, when when these uh, Seventh Day Adventist people get all over you, or Hebrew roots people get all over you. Is how come you go to church on Sunday? You worship in the pagan god, the sun god, and uh, how come you don't go on the Sabbath? And say, well, uh, number one. Jesus rose from the dead on the first day of the week. We commemorate his, his resurrection. Uh, he is our Sabbath. He is our rest. The Bible makes that very, very clear. And uh, the first things always belong to the Lord. So seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall happen unto you. And so we, we worship the Lord on the first day of the week. To start off the week and then, then we give that day over to him. God then gives us the rest of the week and we serve God and so on. And besides that, I've asked people point blank. If you can show me in the law any place where God commands that we publicly together worship him on only one day of the week and are forbidden by God from worshiping him on any other day of the week. If you can show me that in the law, I will gladly submit it. And you know, one lady that uh, she used to call our ministry, she was a real sweet lady, but she, uh, at that time, I think, was Seventh-day Adventist or referred to herself that way. When I asked her that question, she didn't have an answer for it. And over the, the course of the next several months, she changed her mind. And when she passed away, she passed away right. And she said, she called me one day. And she said, I'm glad that you showed me that. that they were, you're right. There is no law in the Bible that says that. I said, it's exactly right. And when we get judged, we're going to get judged by the law. We're going to get judged by what God said, not, not what Helen, Ellen White said. Not what some angel from heaven told her. Phew, boy, you ain't kidding so anyway, um, verse 19, the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut, where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, came Jesus and stood in the midst and saith unto them, and this is interesting because they've shut the doors and they don't want the Jews to find out that the disciples of Jesus are in behind those doors praying seeking god they don't they don't want the jews to know that and i mean what i mean by the jews is the sanhedrin caiaphas the high priest or any of the jewish soldiers they don't want him they don't want them knowing that so how did jesus get in that room <laughs> he just showed up okay uh, came Jesus and stood in the midst. Remember what he said? We're two or more gathered together in my name. There am I in the midst of them. And he saith unto them, Peace be unto you. And when he had so said, he showed unto them his hands 
in his side. Then were the disciples glad when they saw the Lord. I'd be bawling my eyes out. I'd be crying. I'd be down on the floor at his feet, worshiping him. Uh, then said Jesus to them again, peace be unto you. As my father has sent me, even so send I you. And when he had said thus, he breathed on them and saith unto them, receive ye the Holy Ghost. Whosoever sins ye remit, they are remitted unto them. And whosoever sins ye retain, they are retained. Now, we're going to get to that. A little bit later, that last verse. That verse is what the Catholic Church uses to say to people, this is why you must confess your sins to a priest because God has given into the hands of the priesthood the power to remit sins or to retain sins. What that means is they believe that the priesthood of the Catholic Church can either wipe away your sins or they can in a way curse you and not forgive the sins and you are retaining those sins and you will die and go to hell. Now, I, uh, when I did the, the study for this series I did uh, this, this past year on the Catholic Church, the confessional, and the things that I, I learned uh, about that, I can tell you that that is probably the most corrupt system of forgiveness of salvation that exists anywhere. Are you hearing me, Turkana? Are you hearing me, Samburu, Kenya? Are you hearing me, good people uh, who are listening to our radio station? I'm telling you that the Catholic Church in your area is a corrupt machine that gives out uh, the remission of sins based upon those uh, whom have uh, maybe turned over large amounts of money to the church. There are people in your area that have been given a, a sort of a license to do whatever they want to because some priest told them, if you get hand over so many Kenya shillings or whatever, then we'll give you something that as long as you're wearing it, as long as you have it, then you will have all of your sins forgiven all the way up until the day you die and you'll not spend any time in purgatory. And there are people, wealthy people, who have purchased to themselves what they believe is eternal salvation, but they've bought their own damnation as far as the Bible's concerned. Whenever you put your salvation and the forgiveness of your sins into the hands of some man or some organization, you're asking for trouble. Because if that man, that priest, if he doesn't like you, and he doesn't uh, care about your family, and, and I will tell you this, it would not be outside of the scope of possibility that somebody, maybe, maybe there's a family, a wealthy family that doesn't like you, that are maybe uh, in competition business-wise against you. It is perfectly within the realm of what the Catholic Church does to take that man's money and say to the priest, whatever you do, don't forgive their sins. And they'll do it. You know why? Because the love of money is the root of all evil. And the Catholic Church is God. Is money. Mammon. It's not Jesus Christ. 
The reason being is Jesus offers salvation absolutely free of charge. Free of money. Those of you who have nothing to your name will have riches and glory one of these days if you'll trust in Jesus and not the priest. Amen. But anyway, I'll, I said I'll get to that later on. Uh, and, I'll, and I'll show you what the Bible means by this. The Bible will explain it for you. And then it'll make sense, okay? But um, look at uh, where Jesus, in verse um, 22, when he had said this, he breathed on them and saith unto them, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. Now, who is he breathing on at this time? Think about it. Who is he breathing on? The apostles. That's very important. He's breathing on the apostles and he's giving them the gift and it's a gift of the Holy Spirit. Now what does that Holy Spirit do? What, what, why was Jesus giving it to them first? Okay, I believe because, and I'll show you this, out of them first is going to come the teachings, the doctrines, the word of God, the, new, the words and the teachings of the new covenant, the new testament, the, uh, the out, of, out of John, out of uh, Matthew, out of, uh, out of those men is going to come the gospel of Jesus Christ. They're going to write it down. Okay. So he gives it to them first. He breathes on them. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 15. Concerning Christ doing what he's doing. I mean notice that Jesus didn't lay hands on them. He didn't touch their forehead. They didn't pass out. They didn't fall backward. They didn't uh, dance around. They didn't speak in some gibberish, did they? No, none of that happened. So I, I do not agree with the doctrine that says when you are filled with the Holy Spirit, you lose your mind. You literally go out of your mind. You fall backward. Uh, or you speak some unknown Language that nobody knows. Those guys did not do that at that time. So 1 Corinthians 15, 44, he's talking about uh, the resurrection. And he says, uh, the seed, he said, it is sown a natural body and it's raised a spiritual body. There is a natural body and there is a spiritual body. And so it is written, the first man, Adam, was made a living soul. He's talking about Genesis, Adam. The last Adam was made a quickening spirit. And so notice the last Adam, back in this verse again, he is a quickening spirit. And he breathes on them and he gives those men a new life, a new purpose, a new calling. He's going to leave them before too long and leave basically the work of building the church into their hands, they're going to have the power of God's Holy Ghost living in them, dwelling in them, guiding them, causing them to write down the things. And even though we don't have any of the um, any of the uh, the writings, let's say of um, of Philip, Philip being one of the apostles, one of the uh, disciples of Christ at that time, we don't have a book in the Bible written by Philip, but I can guarantee you we have a man by the name of Philip who after that and after the day of Pentecost went around teaching and preaching everywhere Jesus Christ. I mean, we, God used Philip to show up there to the Ethiopian eunuch and then he expounds on Isaiah 53. Philip, having perfect knowledge now of what Isaiah 53 is all about, it explains it to the eunuch. The eunuch is saved, he's baptized, and it's, boy, I love this. Philip comes out of the water and he says, Scotty, one to beam up. And Philip's gone. I love that. 
Um, I have a theory. You want to hear it? I think it's going to happen again. I think it's going to happen again. I may be wrong. Been wrong before. So if it happens, you can say, wow, Mike, that was really good. If it doesn't happen, just forget I said anything. All right. But anyway. Um, so at the second Adam, who is Christ, is made, was made a quickening spirit. The word quickening means being made alive again. So Jesus breathes on them. Just like God breathed on Adam, Genesis 2, verse 7, the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And man became a living soul. Now, God's breath. I want you to turn to 2 Timothy 3. If you would, you're going to see God's breath in action. And let me say this. The breath of God does not, when it goes in you, does not, again, turn you into a drunk. Kenneth Hagin, I have the video somewhere, who taught back when it was a, a live Christian uh, Life Christian Center or something like that. Kenneth Hagin was there teaching everybody that when you get full of the Holy Ghost, you become like a drunkard. And he uses Acts chapter 2 to say these men are full of new wine. And Hagin says, why would they say that? Is it because they must have been acting like drunks. They were drunk. And then he goes on to mention, I think what Paul said to uh, Timothy, um, he said, uh, be not drunk with wine. And he doesn't finish that part of it. He says, he skips over wherein is excess. He said, but be ye drunk, be ye filled, be ye drunk with the, with the Holy Spirit. He added and changed the word of God. The word of God there says, be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be ye filled with the Spirit. Hagen adds the words, be ye drunk with the Spirit. And no wonder, because everybody, and I can, boy, showing that, watching, watching these people like Kenneth uh, Copeland and Kenneth Hagen and other people, laying all over the top of each other in the front of this church while everybody there is hooping and hollering and getting happy and running around. And nobody has any discernment whatsoever on this thing. It's disgusting. It is. The men that travel with Kenneth Hagen, they're part of the act and they know how to act drunk and they know how to pass out at the right time. They know the cues. And literally you had men laying on top of men in a pile up there. And it's just, it was awful. Um, the vine of Sodom. Amen. The vine of Sodom. By the way, did you see the uh, Pope Francis is now... Blessing sodomite marriages. He doesn't do it in Saint. Uh, he doesn't do it in Saint Peter's uh, Cathedral. He doesn't do it in Saint Paul's. Doesn't do it in the church building. He goes to them. They join hands. He gives. A, you know what he's doing? He's Christ to the Catholic Church. He's Christ. He's the Vicar of Christ. And he says he basically is giving his stamp of approval on their wedding. Even though church law says that that's illegal, that's against church canon, it's against uh, what we believe as Catholics. Uh, even though they practice it, they say it's wrong. Okay? And, uh, but he is blessing now um, gay couples. 
That's the vine of Sodom and the fruit that is manifested of it. What's God going to do? He's going to do what he did to Sodom one of these days. You mark it down, okay? So, um, God breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. Here's what I'm saying about this Holy Spirit thing. When the Holy Spirit comes on you, he gives you words. He gives you things to say to people that they should neither gainsay nor resist. He brings Bible verses to your mind. He says them to you and, and then all of a sudden light comes on. That's what happens with the breath of God. So automatically now Adam receiving the breath of life. 2 Timothy 3.16 all scripture is given by, if you want to underline this word, inspiration. In fact, the phrase, inspiration of God. That is an, a 100% accurate translation of the Greek. The Greek word here is theopneustos. Theos for what? What does theos mean? Theology. What is theology? Huh? Study of, God. Study of God. Theos is God. So thea neustos. Uh, it's based on the word pneuma or pneumos. Have you ever used a pneumatic tool? You ever used a pneumatic tool? What drives them? Air. Okay. So... You have two words together, theos and pneumos, or pneuma, okay? So pneuma stands for breath, theos stands for God. So God breathed is literally how the word is. It comes out in English as inspiration of God. It's the same thing. Same, same, that is how it is translated in English. All scripture is given by Theopneustos, inspiration of God. Okay? So when God, when God breathed through the Holy Spirit to Paul as he's writing the book of Galatians, we know that every single word that Paul wrote was the exact words that God wanted Paul to write. We know then later on that as early church men were taking the book of Galatians and they were writing and making copies of it, we know because of what the Bible says that every word that they were copying down, they copied correctly. Because God promised that he would not let his word fade away. Then we also know that as those men, those learned divine men all over England, the 54 primary scholars plus all of the available clergymen of of England or available scholars of England, whether they were Church of England or whether they were the Puritans, they were, they were tasked with correctly translating and when the committee ran into a place where they weren't sure about the proper translation, they sent it out to the area men, the scholars or the, the different various, uh, they called them divines back then, but basically they were clergymen. And they said, hey, we're having some difficulties with this. Uh, what, is, what is your, uh, uh, what do you see? How do you think this should be properly translated? And they would submit their findings. And then that group would look at it and say, okay, we're going to adopt this, but we're going to send it to the next group. And the next group's going to look at it and see if what we got is right. And I believe that God took every word that was in Greek, Hebrew, and Aramaic and used those men to correctly translate every single word that's in our Bibles. I asked the three questions. Who inspired your Bible? Who preserved your Bible? And who translated your Bible? And if you say man in anywhere of that, you're wrong. And I can prove it you're wrong. So, 
the breath of life coming to us is the inspiration of God, which is the scriptures. And it's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. So there, I think the reason why Jesus breathes on these disciples first is because they need it. They need it right there. Jesus is about ready to leave. And when he leaves, they will, they can't be left to themselves. They have to be ready to preach, to teach, to make sure that the doctrines are correct. Uh, they're the ones who met in uh, 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 Acts chapter uh, 15. They're the Jerusalem council where they all met together and said, okay, this is, uh, we got an issue here. Should the uh, Gentiles uh, be circumcised and keep the law? And they all agreed, no, huh? We can't, we didn't keep the law. Don't make them keep the law. Uh, Job chapter 12. Oh, I like this. Job chapter 12, verse 8. Speak to the earth and it shall teach thee. See, I like this. Because God does leave examples in, in the things that he created, didn't he? You want to understand what lions are like? Study lions. Go watch Rob the Ranger on YouTube. He's, he knows lions, man. He's, he's been around lions all his professional career. And he knows how they act. And he knows how they do. And... When a lion roareth, like you see in the Bible, it, depending on the, 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 uh, the tone and the volume of the roar, more than likely he's sending a note out to everybody saying, I'm here and this is my territory. If you can hear my voice, don't cross me. And that not only is sent out to all the other animals, but it's to any challenger lion, male lion that could be in the area. That lion's going, you're not coming over here. I'll kill you. I'll kill you and eat your heart out is what I'll do. Okay? Uh, speak to the earth and it shall teach thee. And the fishes of the sea shall declare unto thee. Who knoweth not in all these that the hand of the Lord hath wrought this. In whose hand is the soul of every living thing and the breath of all mankind. Now. I'm going to posit for you uh, uh, an idea. The soul of man is his breath. People, we, li we live in a day now where um, people can be kept alive almost indefinitely by machines and there's a question about at what point does a person actually die um, I absolutely believe that it has everything to do with the breath so when we look back at Genesis chapter 2 Adam was laying there his body was perfectly intact but he lacked breath. And so, what did he need? He needed breath. And when God breathed into his nostrils, man became a living what? Soul. So here you have, I think, a double witness. Verse 10, in whose hand is the soul of every living thing and the breath. See, that when the Bible puts them together like that, it's defining it. The soul of every living thing and the breath of all mankind. So our soul is our breath. And as long as we retain our breath and our breath is working, then our soul, I believe, is in the body. When the breathing stops, I believe the soul departs. Okay, now that's just my, the way I see it. Uh, when I die, I'll let everybody know, okay? Unless you die before me, okay? Th then we'll just have a little powwow in heaven and talk about it for a million years, amen? All right, I'm going to stop here because that's where I'm going.